to Sunday. The objects people choose to keep in their home define who they are. This is Objectified Benjamin Netanyahu. It is so nice to meet you, Mr. Prime Pleasure Minister. Pleasure to see you. Thank you. I'm Harvey Levin. This is the story about a man who steered Israel's destiny for two decades. Benjamin Netanyahu did not have political aspirations until his brother was killed by terrorists. It was as if my world uh, had collapsed. Bibi, as he's known, became an unstoppable political force as prime minister, a job he would not recommend to his children. Your kids, do you encourage them to go into politics? No. The job has been treacherous, security shadowing his every move. There's a photo of me with one of my boys and, I don't know, half a dozen security guards standing with machine guns. He's the prime minister of a nation that has survived the impossible, a country that remains a flashpoint of world controversy. Hello there. Hi, how are you, Harvey? It is so nice to meet you, Mr. Pleasure Prime Minister. Pleasure to see you, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be different than other interviews you've done because this is not about policy. It's not about the state of the world. It's about you and how you became who you are today. And we're gonna tell the story. It's about life. It's about life. Wow. Okay. Told, let's go in here, told through objects that you've kept over the years. Uh -huh. And let's start with childhood. So tell me what this is, I'm intrigued. Uh, these are taken from a tree that uh, my father planted in our backyard. How old were you? I was about five or six. I went to the garden. My father was a professor, and he's digging. He's digging this thing around, this sapling. Right. And I said, uh, my father, uh, what are you doing? He says, come and help me. Here, dig and duck. He said, take some water, water it. Okay, take some fertilizer, fertilize it. Done. A year later, I go to the garden, and my father's doing the same thing. I said, Father, what are you doing? He said, same thing. He said, but you did that last year. He said, yeah, but you see, the tree got bigger. And today, these trees are gigantic. So that's the story of Israel. You know, you have to water the tree. You have to dig it. You have to make sure it gets enough sunshine, and you have to give it enough uh, fertilizer. But the tree grows against all odds. Your dad. Tell me about him. He got you into the habit of understanding how to, uh, how to think, how to read, how to appreciate breadth of knowledge. He was very opinionated, um, especially about Israel. Were you conscious of that when you were a kid? Well, I was conscious of his opinions, but not politically. We never spoke politics at home. Really? Yeah. When you look back, what is the best quality that you think you got from your dad? the ability to uh, clarify your thoughts. Here's my message to the rulers of Iran. Your plan to destroy Israel will fail. I have not read a lot about your mom. What about her? How'd she influence you? How not? I mean, she was the pivot of the family. She kept the whole thing together. She used to say, I, you know, I'm married to a genius, which she was, but even a genius needs somebody to take care of his socks. She raised us, uh, three sons, uh, and at the same time took care of my father. Israel celebrates its seventh Independence Day, and streets of Tel Aviv echo to cheers for the armed forces of the proud young nation. When you were growing up, I would think that you were scared a lot. Well, I had a wonderful childhood. So you were, there was no fear no. that everything around you were people who didn't want you guys no, to exist? We didn't, we didn't have the faintest idea of that. How we, is that? Well, it was, first of all, it was a different world, you know. But you're in a tiny place. It was a confidence, a self-confidence in the newly emerged uh, nation. And we were the generation that was born with the state of Israel. I was born one year after the uh, Declaration of Independence of the State, and I, it was natural to me. You are the middle child. Yeah. And I've done interviews now with many people who have older brothers, and it seems like the parents always targeted the older brother and said, he's the one that is going to do great things. And Yoni was an exceptional person, and what I've read is your, 
Your dad especially said, this is the kid who's going to go into the military, be a hero, go into politics. Did you feel that shadow with the older brother? Psychobabble. My father, the last thing he wanted was for Yoni to go into the military or into politics. This is a superimposition of the Kennedy family onto our family, and nothing could be further from the truth. When you were a kid, what did you want to do? What did you want to be? Uh, anything. I wanted to be a soccer player. I wanted to be, a, you know, a, a soccer playing scholar. Who knows? I mean, uh, I didn't really think about it. Uh, I didn't have uh, personal ambitions uh, until much, much, much later in life. <laughs> so this looks like you in control. Seems uh, appropriate. Looks like my son. <laughs> Tell me about this. When was this taken? I guess it was taken in some soccer match when I came to the United States. How old were you? You were, what, 16, 17? Something like that, yeah. No, but I was. I came in at about 13 and played soccer. I, I, it was a very peculiar time, you know? I went to an American high school in the 60s. Right. Can you imagine? Cheltenham High, class of 67. His yearbook picture at the bottom left. Benjamin Netanyahu, on the soccer team in the chess club, remembered as a serious student. Well, what I can't imagine is, and is, it, it, high school can be tough. You have this Israeli Jew who goes to an American high school. Yeah. On a level, that must be tough. The level in terms of uh, scholastically? Or? No, in terms of well, I didn't know just English fitting that in. Well. No, in terms of fitting in. I didn't fit in, but I, you know, I actually fit in quite well with everyone. I didn't, uh, I didn't have any there was a language barrier. No, I overcame that fairly quickly. We have Israel. It's a pretty amazing and special country. And unfortunately, it needs an army in order to survive. So if I want Israel to continue existing for future generations, I have to do my part to help defend it. In America, um, I don't think generally there is this passion about serving your country, the, and I know there isn't, the way, there, the way it is here. And here you are on a trajectory of success in America and you go home and join the Israeli army. So what drove you back? Well, I, I had a very strong identity having been born here, having been raised here, knowing Jewish history. I never thought of my life as separate from the life of, uh, of my people and my country. I never thought. I, I think they're intertwined. This is a free country. And if I said, what is the greatest battle that we face? Of course, we, we live in a tough neighborhood. And we have to defend ourselves. And we have the bravest soldiers in the world to do that. I always thought you have to have a balance between individual ambition and, the, and collective responsibility. For the first time in a hundred generations, we, the Jewish people, can defend ourselves. I can promise you one more thing. Even if Israel has to stand alone, Israel will stand. We were completely defenseless. We couldn't protect ourselves. We couldn't complain about the things that were being done to us. But that's in your consciousness when you're 13, so that you that's come back. That's in my consciousness, not when I'm 13, when I'm three. Did you ever think about staying in the US? It sounds like you didn't. No. You were always gonna go back. Always. But I thought I'd bring back the things that I learned. What American values did you bring back? Initiative, meritocracy. These are strong, strong values. That the way you advance is through merit. Uh, that uh, the society should be open to all to compete. That if you invest effort and ingenuity, you're likely to succeed. That these are strong American values that have their resonance in, uh, I think, in Jewish values. You went to Cheltenham High School? Yeah. So, uh, be honest with me, who's the uh, most famous alum? You or Reggie Jackson? In Israel? Me. <laughs> in America? Reggie Jackson <laughs> by, you know, a hundred yards. <laughs> this is the uh, book of letters of my, uh, my brother. Uh, which we collected after his uh, uh, death in Antibia. He was an unbelievable writer. 
Somebody um, told me the way they referred to him was, they said, um, Yoni has all the golf clubs in the bag. Yeah, no, he was, uh, he was an exceptional uh, uh, human being and turned out to be um, an unbelievable uh, leader and a great military commander. He had uh, indescribable courage and he was, there was nothing pompous about it, you know? He never, he never played the part. He was the genuine article, and everybody who knew him knew it. He, he didn't have to buy. Uh, let's say this: he never, he didn't have to die to be a legend. You know, he was a legend already in his life. You have said that when you were at MIT and and he was killed in Entebbe, that you said the hardest thing that you've ever had to do in your life was tell your parents that you were the one. Yeah, it was. Um, that was uh, indescribable agony. When my younger brother called me and told me that uh, Yoni had been killed in Antebe, uh, which I had a premonition uh, that he would tell me that, uh, it was as if my world uh, had collapsed. I just finished uh, MIT to my parents. My father was teaching at Cornell at the time. And um, I didn't want the news to reach him through the news. There were funerals in both Israel and Uganda today. The results of Israel's weekend raid to rescue more than 100 hostages from pro-Palestinian hijackers at Enabe Airport in Uganda. Three hostages lost their lives, along with the commanding officer of the raiding party, but most reached Israel in safety. So I drove for seven hours in this you know, horror, uh, then parked the car not far from my parents' home, uh, and walked up the path that led to their house. And there was a big window in their living room, and I could see my father pacing back and forth you know, his hands behind his back. And all of a sudden, he turned his gauge, and he saw me, and he had this, Bibi, what are you doing? And then immediately understood, mm. because he had heard about the news of the rescue. And so he understood, and there was this horrible shriek that he gave, and then I heard my mother shriek. And so it was like a second death. It was actually worse. Well, um, how did his death change your view of Israel, of terrorism, just your worldview? Well, uh, there's no question that Yoni's death in Antebbe changed my life and, and steered it uh, to its present course. Of course, I didn't know it at the time, uh, but I felt that I had to uh, do something about this scourge of terrorism. Nobody wants peace more than Israel. But the stumbling block to the road for peace is this demand for a PLO state, which will mean more war, which will mean more violence in the Middle East. Israel wants to live in peace and wants to be secure. If that involves maintaining our own military guarantees against the destruction uh, of people who surround us, yes, I believe we should fight for our survival. And then there was also the question, well, the terrorists are, you know, they have a good grievance. Uh, and they're acting out of, uh, you know, trying to correct a grievance. I said, no, they're not. You know, because people who deliberately murder babies or blow up buses, they don't have freedom on their minds. They'll trample their own people once they get into power, which they do, invariably. What terrorists do is target the innocent deliberately. And therefore, my definition of terrorism is the, innocent, the systematic and deliberate attack, the murder, maiming, and menacing of innocents, of civilians, for uh, political goals. If Yoni had not died, do you think you would have gone into politics? Absolutely not. You wouldn't have? Nope. So it became a calling? It was, it, the public battle against terrorism became a calling. Your military career was incredibly distinguished, but can you describe what happened uh, with Sabine Airlines with the hijacking? 
הצליחו כוחות צה"ל להשתלט על המטוס, לשחרר את 90 הנוסעים ואנשי הצוות ולהרוג ולשבות את ארבעת המחבלים שניסו ללא הצלחה לסחוט שחרורם של כמאה מחבלים. My vision is you walk on the plane as a mechanic yeah. and you then, you know, grab one of the terrorists, you push her against the seat, you, um, eventually you got shot in the middle of all of this. So I have this big vision of what you did. Well, it's all true, except that there, something preceded it. See, this was a, a hijacking of a Sabina airplane bound for Israel and it was captured by four Arab terrorists, two men, two women, okay? They got it into Ben-Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, and they said that unless we release such and such uh, prisoners, they're going to blow up the plane. But we had absolutely no knowledge of what you do in a situation like this. And they gave us about five minutes of uh, pistol training, and then this guy taps me on the shoulder. This guy who was a security guy, and he says, uh, well, BB, you got you to stop the operation. And I said, what's the problem? He said, look, I was flying in from uh, London and the, uh, you know, the toilets were completely occupied. And I said, the minute I'd get to Tel Aviv, uh, you know, I'd go to the toilets and I landed and you grabbed me here. So I have to go. <laughs> I said, I have to go now. He says, now. And I said, big or small? He says, big. <laughs> so. This is all true. So I, you know, jump off the wing, go to the commander, who was actually Eud Barak, and I said, Eud, uh, we have to stop this for a second. He said, what's the problem? I said, well, this guy's name is Tur. He has to, he has to go. He said, now. He said, now. He said, big or small, big. <laughs> and, and so he, you know, he jumped off the plane, uh, got under the airplane, did whatever he needed to do, and then we'd go back and we resumed this thing, and then we broke into the plane. Oh, and, and I was shot by another one of these security guards who shot me by, by accident. That was friendly fire. Wow. Didn't feel friendly at all. <laughs> <laughs> that hurt like hell. <laughs> So the books you have here are Hamilton, a book on uh, MacArthur, yeah. and a book on George Washington. This is your American uh, period. No, I read a lot of other books too, but I, I read a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm not just, you know, I read a lot. What inspires you about, I mean, these are obviously three yeah. giants in America. Well, I didn't know Washington that well until I started reading him and my appreciation for him grew. There was a Veterans Day, I happened to be in the U.S. and I thought I'd go to Mount Vernon to pay a tribute to the, uh, the greatest veteran of them all. And uh, having read uh, you know, the biography, I saw how, what a great leader he was. He was armed with one thing that I've grown to appreciate in my own uh, terms and office. What? Patience. Patience. You live in a fishbowl. You have a relatively small house, a small office. Uh, everywhere you go, you're followed by uh, this phalanx of security. Yeah. I would think at a point you need to find outlets that take you out of that world. Yeah, I do, but they don't let me. Well, what do you do? Because you can't li you, you've lived this way a long time. You have to have outlets. There's a photo of me with uh, one of my boys, little boys, and I don't know, half a dozen security guards standing with machine guns. We're sitting in the sand on the beach. And Princess Diana saw this picture and said, how horrible that is. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's horrible, but you want to be able to go out to the beach and you want to go out to a coffee shop, right? And you want to sit in a room and, you know, open the curtains, okay? And that's occasionally what I uh, insist on. When you have this kind of security everywhere you go, do you worry that it disconnects you from the public? Um, there's no chance of that because I have two uh, young men, my sons at home, and they, you know, they follow uh, the internet. They tell me what young people think. They tell me what their friends think. Uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes I, I wish that they wouldn't because I'd like to, you know, I'd like to be, uh, you know, disconnected from what is happening now in our world, 
in our... Why? Why would you want that? Because what you have is the internet has created this thing of instant referendums. So what happens is you have uh, uh, political leaders who are constantly bombarded, right, by polarized opinion, right? And I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's inevitable. It's there. We all work with it. We all understand it. But I like the idea of representative government. Representative government says you're elected, you're given a period to uh, exercise that power, and then they can throw you out. The problem today for politicians is not being disconnected. The problem is they're overly connected, and they're completely at the mercy of these shifting tides of opinion that are reflected in the net. And that's not good. <laughs> if you want to know how long I've been in this business, this is uh, from my first term in office 20 years ago in the prime minister's house during a, a rare snowstorm. And that is our Sarah, my wife, our, our little boy. He's like four been, years old. Yeah, something like that. Uh, barely out of diapers. And his older brother, Yair. Now, Flash forward 20 years later, same place, you see, same place. Oh my God, you found snow. snow again. Yeah, Sarah, still beautiful. This old clunker, that's me. And look at that, that's uh, the little boy here. He's now a soldier in the army. And that's his brother, uh, Yair, who just finished university, can you imagine? I mean, that's it. Tell me a little bit about Sarah. You know, she's the pillar of the family. And she says, you know, she taught me uh, something that I didn't understand the first time I was elected. This is my fourth term. So the first time, first time I was, uh, you know, I was 46 years old, I had young kids, and I devoted everything to the job nonstop, literally, uh, you know, 24, 7, 3, 6, 5. And, you know, then I was thrown out of office. The Netanyahu government has been ousted. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has lost his bid for re-election to Labour Party candidate Ehud Barak by at least 14 percentage points. Which is a very healthy thing to happen to a politician. And then I came back in and served now another three terms. So this time, when the second time when we came into office, she said, you know, we're going to do something different. She said, we're going to give time to our children because it's never going to come back. And because ultimately that's when you come back to. And so we have a uh, Friday night dinner, you know, and then uh, Shabbat lunch. And before that, I always read a portion of the Bible. There's one rule in these two weekly meals that we have. You know what it is? No politics. No phones. There's nothing in this. The gadgets, they're not there, you know? They're all gone. And we just talk to one another, you know? Uh, I'm afraid I can't raise my kids the way I was raised. That is no actual, no current politics discussed because they were born into it. You know, I can relate a lot to what Baron is going through because I've been in his age and my dad's first term. And, yeah. you know, and look how he turns out. It only makes you stop. Their political understanding of is nothing of the kind that I had is at their age. It's much more advanced. I'm treading on dangerous ground here because my understanding is there's not a traditional first lady of Israel, but she really has become effectively the first lady, and some people don't like the concept of that. Well, they certainly have attacked her in order to attack me. They can't bring me down, so they, you know, they, they engage in uh, just terrible uh, attacks and unwarranted attacks on her. And she has great courage and great capacity to withstand that, raise a family. Uh, she gives everything she has to her kids. She's, she's a Jewish mother, if you ever saw one. I mean, she really, uh, you know, she really worries about the kids and the family. And she's also, she works as a child psychologist. So every week she goes for a few days to these religious schools where she's Sarah, the psychologist, they don't even know. These uh, little kids, little girls, they don't know that she's uh, the prime minister's wife. They have no idea. Does it hurt you when the media is critical of her? Yes, 
horrible. It hurts me. It hurts me a lot more that they, when they attack her than when they attack me. The police have recommended that the Prime Minister's wife, Sarah Netanyahu, stand trial on graft allegations. This after announcing the conclusion of their investigation against Mrs. Netanyahu concerning spending irregularities at the Prime Minister's official and private residences. Does she want out? Well, she certainly enjoyed the time that we were out, I have to tell you that. When I lost the first, uh, uh, you know, the election, that ended my first term. I'll tell you what we did. We went to Disneyland. Remember these were small kids in California. Wait a minute, you're about to tell me what do you do when you lose the election? I'm going to Disneyland? Took you my, actually did the commercial. I, kid, <laughs> I took my kids to Disneyland, they loved it. And then we went to Australia and were lost on a beach for, you know, I don't know, two weeks. It was no politics, no phones, different time zones. It was absolutely magnificent. Your kids, do you encourage them to go into politics? No. Do no. you discourage them? Yeah. Why? It doesn't help. I mean, it may not help, but yeah, of course, because, because it's a very tough life. First of all, I don't think it makes a difference of what we tell our kids. I think they'll do whatever they, they please. Are either inclined? Uh, Maybe one, I'm not sure, but I hope not. Hmm. Do you tell him that? Yes. Yeah, I do. Of course I tell him. But it served you well. Why? You think I couldn't make a living outside? You could make a living, but you've made a difference. Yes, you, you make a difference, but you... You pay the price. You pay the price. Israel. A small country with the highest number of startups per capita in the world. Okay, I am fascinated. Show me what you got for technology. Oh, how about this? See that? You know what that is? I have no idea. This is a pill cam. It's a, cam. It's a pill. You can swallow it right now. It'll go right through your system and give a uh, computer out there a full picture. These images then travel from the sensors along the wires to the data recorder for later reading by a physician. So this is like an, M like an MRI? Yeah, except, except it goes out and it's not painful and you don't have to go under these machines or anything like that. May I? And it's, you remember those uh, sci-fi films of the people going in submarines sure. inside the body? That's it. That's an Israeli uh, invention, which is, is tremendous. It saves a lot of lives. When was this developed? A few years ago, and it's, uh, it works. Israel is the digital powerhouse of the world. Where did you develop this passion for technology? I know you went to MIT, but you were studying architecture and business. Yeah, but you know, you, in MIT, you take all these courses, and you see, you see what's happening. When I was there, they were still using punch cards for computers, so you see how ancient that is. And I, I just understood that the world is changing very rapidly. You, you said something in 1976 that just really hit me. You were talking about newspapers creating a database right. that would kind of revolutionize the way they're able to do their work because they would essentially have dossiers on anybody they wanted. How about Google? I mean, well, you skipped the newspapers. Then. Well, but you envision Google. You envision Google in 1976. It sounds like Al Gore, you know. Um, <laughs> but that is kind of the. No, I didn't. I, I can't tell you. I understood that there's great change, and I understood that you have to create the environment for this creativity. Did you ever worry about privacy back then? That if people have databases like this that privacy would really start to wane or was that in, in your head well um in a way but not because of that but because of my years in, in the military and my familiarity with the way intelligence uh services work that's why if you walk into my office uh you won't see a computer you won't see a television screen, and you certainly won't see, you know, uh, a phone, you know, one of these uh, cellular phones, because anyone who uses this stuff today is exposed. Now, I'm not sure everybody is interested in what I have to say if I were a private citizen, but I'm sure they're interested when I'm the Prime Minister of Israel.
What gives you the most pride in terms of technology in Israel? If there's one, one thing. Cherry tomatoes. <laughs> that was uh, developed here too. I, I'm not sure it was invented here, but it was perfected here. Uh, so it's from cherry tomatoes to life-saving drugs to uh, medical technology to basically if you take your cell phone, a good chunk of it is made in Israel. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the technology, uh, a lot of the programming, a lot of the uh, apps made in Israel. You have Waze system? Yes. That's an Israeli company. Google has completed its purchase of Waze for a little over a billion dollars. Google sees the benefit of acquiring Waze. They're going to keep them based in Israel. Ultimately, I think Google made us the right choice here by acquiring Waze. It was a smart acquisition in my mind. What is happening very rapidly is a big revolution in which Israel has the other most dynamic technology economy in the world. The first one is definitely the United States. The second by many accounts of people who know and who have proven the great capability of investing their money, the second place is Israel. But there is a problem with this new industry. It's called cybersecurity. And the possibilities of sabotage and worse are all there. With the click of a button, you can bring down nations to their knees very rapidly. Is technology the key to security in Israel at this point? It's one of the keys, but the most important key is the uh, willingness of the people to give of themselves to defend the country. And Don't they kind of merge at a point? Yes, but I think that technology by itself doesn't do it. I think you need courage. Sign a Tell me what this is. Oh, that's our uh, guest book. People uh, come into the Prime Minister's residence, they sign in. World leaders. Yeah. Wow. A lot of them. Huh. They just, they just don't sign their name. They write a note, don't they? This is the Obamas. It was a great honor to reaffirm the extraordinary bond between our two countries. May our bonds continue to grow on behalf of people and prosperity for all people. What was the visit like? It was great. It was great. Because you had your issues there. Yeah, we disagreed on a few things. Iran, Palestinians, small things. But we also found uh, areas of agreement and, and I think of mutual respect. And I, I didn't hide when I disagreed. I, I made a... I made it clear. May I give you an observation? Yeah, sure. That you have become a master at dealing with people you disagree with because that's your life in Israel, trying to govern a country with this, so many factions. Uh, well, it's not quite the same way, but when I feel that the interest of my country and the survival of my country is at stake, I don't hesitate to stake out a position. Iran's rulers promised to destroy my country, murder my people, and the response from this body, the response from nearly every one of the governments represented here has been absolutely nothing. Utter silence. You have these four factions in this country. You've got ultra-Orthodox, you've got Orthodox, you've got traditional, you've got secular. What four? What are you talking about? We have at least Well, I know you have 22. Six, seven, eight. I mean, but, but those are big factions. Yeah. And I'm curious how you can form alliances, because what I've noticed just on the street, in taxi cabs, is there are a lot of secular uh, Israelis, there are a lot of traditional Israelis who have a thing against the ultra-Orthodox and think they don't work, they don't, uh, they don't pay taxes, they don't, uh, they don't serve in the military, they have views on terms of social issues like gay rights that are out of step. So how do you form a coalition where you've got this dis these disparate groups? How do, you, how do you govern? Well, by persuasion, primarily. We tried a positive approach, carrots as opposed to sticks, get more and more of them going out to the job market. Crucial, crucial for reducing poverty. 
because we found that when both parents work, poverty rates decline, they just plummet. Orthodox women now work uh, as much as the general population. This is a country which has, in which Arabs have full rights, something they've been denied in all the vast lands around us. This is a country where a woman is the chief justice of the Supreme Court, where a woman is a general, and a woman in this country can sit anywhere she wants. That's our position. Somebody in your government told me that the smartphone may have changed the whole landscape of Israel because people who are ultra-Orthodox, especially young people, they start reading and they, they develop a consciousness that they never were exposed to before. Yeah, it's definitely changing. I didn't, I didn't say, um, you know, I think, I think the technology is having an effect. I look at this book and it's filled with signatures from world leaders. Right. You're a tiny country and you get more attention more media attention, I think, than any country other than the U.S. in the world. Your tiny country. A day of rage against Israel. A thousand rockets have been fired. Israel is on high alert and fight. Is that something you court by design? No. Sometimes I wish we'd get less attention. Really? Because our story isn't always told. Our desire for peace, our, uh, the fact that we, we've paid the uh, the price of war, that we have lost. I've lost a brother, I've lost friends, I had you know, one of my earliest recollections in the army was that uh, a fellow soldier died in my arms, you know, literally died in my arms. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, there is no country that wants peace more than the people that prays for peace more. And yet we're often portrayed in the opposite terms. And it's uh, a rash of uh, distortions that uh, concern me. Uh, not distortions about me personally, I'm not concerned with that, but with the distortions of our people who are, who, who yearn for peace. We're so proud that our small country is making such a huge contribution to the entire world. Yet the dreams of our people, those dreams will be fully realized only when there is peace. You've courted the Hollywood community uh, you've talked to Leo DiCaprio, Clint Eastwood, Robert De Niro, and others to make movies. Pretty good actors, huh? Very good actors. That's it. To, to make movies, to portray Israel a certain way, is that the point? Well, Hollywood is important, obviously, but, the, you know, uh, I've had uh, uh, opportunities to meet a lot of people, celebrity, but there's a difference between successful political leaders and actors. Successful political leaders write their own lines. But if your storyline isn't being told right, right, why not just do it yourself because you've always done that rather than go to them and try to court them to change the storyline? It's never been done as effectively as it was done by the Bible. So we'll have to figure out a, a, a new way to get the, uh, the story out. Here's one of them, giving this interview. Fair enough. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for the Good time. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you. Thank you so much for thank the time. You.